What are everyday addictions and how can we work with them? What if I told you that we're all addicted to something? Now your initial thought is probably a quick, no way, I'm not an addict. You might think about the terrible toll of heroin or opioid addiction or of the stinky smell of cigarettes and think to yourself that addiction is something that happens to other people. I'm different than that, aren't I? Well, that's exactly what I thought. I'm a normal guy who grew up in Indiana. My mom made sure that I ate my vegetables, got an education, and stayed away from drugs. Perhaps I got a little too excited about all of this, as now as in my 40s, I'm a vegetarian, I have too many graduate degrees, an MD and a PhD, and I'm an addiction psychiatrist. Everything a boy could do to make his mom proud. It wasn't until I was in my psychiatry residency training at Yale that I really learned about addiction. I saw patients addicted to meth, to cocaine, to heroin, alcohol, cigarettes, you name it. Many of them were addicted to multiple substances at the same time, and many had been in and out of rehab many times as well. People who knew the costs of their addictions on their health, their relationships, and their life, and yet could not get back in control. In my residency training, that's also where I learned the definition of addiction. Addiction isn't just the use of chemicals such as nicotine, alcohol, and heroin. It's much bigger than that. The simple definition of addiction is this, continued use despite adverse consequences. Continued use despite adverse consequences. Wow, that goes way beyond cocaine. That could mean continued use of anything. So I asked myself, what if the root of addiction isn't in the substances itself, but somewhere deeper? What really causes addiction? I started doing some research. And the joke for researchers is that research really means me-search, as in, we study our own quirks, our own foibles, and even our own pathology, consciously or unconsciously. I also started asking my friends and coworkers about their habits. Long story short, I found addiction everywhere. Continued tweeting despite adverse consequences. Continued shopping despite adverse consequences. Continued pining away for that special someone despite adverse consequences. Continued computer gaming despite adverse consequences. Continued eating despite adverse consequences. Continued daydreaming despite adverse consequences. Addiction really wasn't limited to the so-called hard drugs and addictive substances. It is everywhere. Is this new? Or did we miss something? The answer? This is old and new. Let's start with the new. The world we live in today is very different than it was just 20 years ago, and even more different than 200 years ago. Let's use where I grew up in the middle of America as an example. Back in the 1800s, if I lived on the prairie or on a farm, and I had a hankering for a new pair of shoes, I'd need to hitch my horse up to my wagon, ride into town, talk to the person at the general store about what shoes I wanted and what size, go back home, wait a couple of weeks, hitch my horse back up to my wagon, go back into town, and assuming I had the money to pay for the shoes, buy the darn shoes. Today, I can be driving home from work, zipping along in traffic, minding my own business, get stuck in traffic, and in a fit of frustration, click on an ad that I saw in my email, yes, targeted to me because Google knows I like shoes, and as if by magic, two days later, thanks to Amazon Prime, a pair of perfectly fitting shoes shows up on my doorstep. You don't need to be an addiction psychiatrist to see that the two-minute, two-click fix is more likely to get you to keep buying shoes than the two-month experience. In the name of convenience and efficiency, the modern world is increasingly designed to create experiences that are addictive. This holds true for things, like shoes and food, and behaviors, like watching TV or playing video games, and even thoughts, like thoughts of politics, romance, or needing to keep up with the latest news. And because all of these are available at a moment's notice through our TVs, our laptops, and smartphones, they can take advantage of any weak moment, such as boredom, frustration, anger, loneliness, or hunger, to offer a simple emotional fix. Buy these shoes, eat this food, check this news feed, and you'll feel better. How did it come to this? 
For that, we need to go back a lot further than Little House on the Prairie. We need to go back to how our brains evolved the ability to learn in order to answer that question. At risk of oversimplifying things, our brains are very complex, as you know, and we're just beginning to scratch the surface, it turns out that our brains have old and new components. The new parts are involved with thinking, creativity, decision-making, and so on. But these newer sections are layered on top of the older parts of our brain, parts that evolve to help us survive. You've heard of fight or flight, right? That's a reaction that starts in your older brain. Another feature of the old brain is what's called the reward-based learning system. Reward-based learning is based on positive and negative reinforcement. You want to do more of the things that feel good and less of the things that feel bad. In fact, this ability is so important and evolved so far back that science can see it in sea slugs. That's right, organisms with only 20,000 neurons in their entire nervous system. In fact, this was a discovery that was so big that Eric Kandel won the Nobel Prize for it. So back in caveman days, this was really helpful. Since food was so hard to come by, if we see some food that looks good, our brain says calories, survival, and we eat the food. We taste it, yummy. And especially with sugar, our brains release a chemical called dopamine that says remember what you're eating and where you found it. We lay down a context-dependent memory, and we learn to repeat the process next time. See food, eat food, feel good, repeat. Trigger, behavior, reward. Pretty simple, right? After a while, our modern creative brain says, hey, you can use this for more than just remembering where food is. Next time you feel bad, why don't you try eating something good so you'll feel better? We thank our brains for that great idea, try this, and quickly learn that if we eat chocolate or ice cream when we're mad or sad, we feel better. Same learning process, just a different trigger. Instead of a hunger signal coming from our stomach, this emotional signal, feeling sad, triggers that urge to eat. Or maybe in our teenage years, we were a nerd and saw the rebel kids outside of school smoking, and we thought, hey, I want to be cool so we started smoking. The Marlboro Man wasn't a dork, and that was no accident. See cool, smoke to be cool, feel good, repeat. Trigger, behavior, reward. And each time we perform the behavior, we reinforce this brain pathway that says, great, do it again. So we do, and it becomes a habit. Later, Feeling stressed out triggers that urge to smoke or to eat something sweet. Now with the same brain mechanisms, we've gone from learning to survive to literally killing ourselves with these habits. Obesity and smoking are among the leading preventable causes of morbidity and mortality in the world. This is our old brain trying to help us survive in a new world and not doing such a good job. And you can see how far this extends. This extends way beyond stress and overeating. It extends to shopping, romance, and even anxiety. If you ever get caught up in a worry habit loop, thought or emotion triggering worry thinking, triggering avoidance or over planning, you know exactly what I mean. Eckhart Tolle even said, One of the greatest addictions you never read about in the papers because people don't know it is the addiction to thinking. Think about that. In fact, this extends so far beyond classical addictions that I had enough research on the topic to fill an entire book called The Craving Mind. That book has entire chapters on addiction to social media, addiction to distraction, addiction to thinking, and even addiction to romantic love. True confession, back in college, I was addicted to love, as the Robert Palmer song goes. I'm in recovery now. Let's now bring old and new brain together. Old, our brains are set up to help us survive. When we're hungry, we use reward-based learning to help us remember where to find food. New brain, this learning process can be leveraged to trigger cravings, create habits, and evoke emotions, and spill over into compulsive behavior like shopping and other types of behavioral addictions. Companies have understood this for quite a while now. 
They spend millions finding just the right amount of salt and sugar and crunch to make food irresistible. Or they spend countless hours tweaking their algorithm to make sure you see the perfect photos, videos, and posts that will keep you scrolling, and on their system, for hours. Or they show you the perfect shoes or the perfect car so you feel like you have to have it. Let's unpack this a bit more. Search engines, big data, and deep learning aside, modern-day psychology and behavioral neuroscience have figured out a few additional addiction maximizers since the days of Little House on the Prairie. First, the most cravogenic type of reinforcement learning is called intermittent reinforcement. As in, when an animal is given a reward that isn't on a regular schedule, or one that seems random, that's intermittent, the dopamine neurons in our brains perk up more than usual. As in, dopamine neurons in the reward circuit of the brain fire when they get a reward that is unexpected. Think of a time when someone surprised you with a gift or a party. I bet you can remember it, right? That's because unexpected rewards fire off dopamine at a much higher rate than expected ones. They make our brain light up like a Christmas tree. In fact, gambling casinos have dialed this in so well that they have a formula or an algorithm that has the slot machines hit just enough times to get people to keep playing, even though on average everyone loses money. That's the casino's winning formula. Silicon Valley has taken this to the next level. It turns out that intermittent reinforcement extends to anything that alerts you to something new. Remember, this is our old brain using the only tricks that it has to try to survive in today's fast-paced and hyper-connected world. It doesn't know the difference between a saber-toothed tiger and a late-night email from your boss. So anything that alerts you from, you've got mail, to a buzz in your pocket for a new like on your social media post, to a buzz in your pocket for a text that you just got, triggers a response in your old brain. Yes, that's right your email, Twitter, Facebook, and so on, which claim to help you stay connected, are designed for maximum addiction, in part because they don't bing, beep, tweet, or chirp at a regular interval. Hint, turn these alerts off on your computer and phone. The second everyday addiction maximizer in the modern day is immediate availability. Buying shoes back in the 1800s was a lot of work. If I had a hankering for new shoes, I couldn't just impulsively order them knowing that they'd show up at my barn the next day. That process made me really think about the costs and benefits. Were the shoes I had really worn out, or would they work for a little while longer? That process takes time. Time is critical for allowing all of that excitement to wash over us. Oh, new shoes, how fun! And importantly, go away. Time gives us, well, time to sober up, so that that sweet juiciness of the moment can fade into the reality of the need. Yes, my shoes have big holes in them. My feet keep getting wet when I walk around the farm. It's worth the time and energy to hitch up the horse, and so on. In the modern world, however, you can take care of any need or desire almost instantly. Stressed out? No problem. Cupcakes are right around the corner. Bored? Check out the latest posts on Instagram. Anxious? Watch cute puppy videos on YouTube. Need a new pair of shoes? As in, see someone with a cute pair of shoes that you have to have? Just hop on Amazon. Use one-click shopping to order now, and your shoes will show up in 28 hours and 14 minutes. Unless, of course, you'd like them sooner. By combining the reward-based learning built into our old brain with intermittent reinforcement and immediate availability, we've created a dangerous formula for modern-day addictions that goes well beyond what we typically think of as substance abuse. I'm not laying this out to scare you. I want you to understand how your mind works and how much of the modern world is designed to create addictive behaviors and capitalize on them. Think of your smartphone as an advertising billboard in your pocket, and a billboard that you pay for. I think it's only fair that you know at least some of what the company's marketing to you and marketing to your brain know to level the playing field a little bit. And it is worth reflecting on this for a moment. 
What are my everyday addictions? What bad habits and unwanted behaviors do I keep doing despite adverse consequences? How about some solutions for our everyday addictions? Now that you know some of the essentials, let's get down to solutions. While the internet is full of tips and tricks to beat bad habits, change behaviors, and overcome everyday addictions, there are only a few potential pathways that psychologists and treatment specialists have outlined that are evidence-based, though I should warn you up front that not all of these are created equal. Some of them depend a lot on what genes our brains are endowed with. Many behavior change strategies only target one part of your brain, leaving you dangerously unprotected at just the moment you need the most help. But fortunately, modern science may have revealed how some ancient practices can bring old and new brain together. Susan Shane wrote a New York Times article with a catchy title, How to Crush Your Habits in the New Year with the Help of Science. Ms. Shane outlined some usual suspects for how to work with everyday addictions willpower, substitutions, priming your environment, celebrating success, breaking habit change down into small steps, and planning to fail. Wait a minute. Yes, habits are so hard to change that as part of my addiction training, I was even taught to help my patients expect failure. But surprisingly, Susan's article left out one effective science-backed approach. More on that in a minute. You might have already tried some of these habit change strategies and hopefully haven't failed too much. So I'll give you some of the basics and then provide some resources that you can dive into if you want to learn more. But first, we have to go back to the simplified model of our brain we discussed earlier. Remember, our old brain is set up to help us survive. In addition to reward-based learning, it has another trick up its sleeve. It takes what it learns and moves the learning into muscle memory as quickly as possible. In other words, our brains are set up to form habits so we can free up the brain space to learn new things. For example, imagine getting up every morning and having to relearn how to stand up, how to put on your clothes, walk, eat, talk, etc. You'd be exhausted by noon. In habit mode, We act quickly, without thinking, because we don't need to think in those moments. Think of this as our old brain telling our new brain, don't worry, I've got this. You don't have to spend energy here and can think about other things. This is partly how the newer parts of our brain were able to evolve the ability to think and plan. From an anatomical perspective, this brain region is called the prefrontal cortex, or the PFC for short and it's located just behind our eyes and our forehead. And since our old habit brain has our back, our prefrontal cortex is freed up to think and plan for the future. This is also the part of the brain we count on for controlling ourselves. If we see a donut, our old brain tries to impulsively pounce on it thinking calorie survival. After all, someone else might swoop in and eat it. So we need to get to it first. Our old brain is constantly functioning in scarcity mode, always worried about starvation. In cases like this, our new brain says to our old brain, Hold off a minute, you just had lunch. This is not healthy and you're not even hungry. Think of it this way. Our new brain is that rational voice that helps us hold off and eat our vegetables before we have dessert. Yes, our new brain is that bit that helps us keep our New Year's resolutions and ironically, is that same voice that judges us when we fail. With that brain background, let's talk about anti-addiction strategy number one, willpower. Good old-fashioned stick-to-itness. Your newer brain telling your older brain to take a hike and ordering the salad instead of the hamburger. There are tons of books written about how to build the mental willpower muscle, and many of them were worth a read. Willpower seems like it should work, but there are two big caveats. First, recent research is calling into question some of the early studies on willpower, some showing that willpower is genetically endowed for a lucky subset, and others being as bold as suggesting that willpower is more of a myth. Other studies have found that people who exerted more self-control were not more successful in accomplishing their goals. On top of that, The more effort they put in, the more depleted they felt. 
buckling down, gritting our teeth, and forcing ourselves to just do it might be counterproductive, perhaps helping out in the short term, but not working in the long term when it really counts. As in, being really strict about your New Year's resolutions in January might make them harder to stick to in February. The second caveat of willpower is the scientific discovery that the prefrontal cortex, remember this is the youngest part of our brain from an evolutionary perspective, is where the willpower magic happens. Which is fine under normal conditions, but when we get stressed, think of saber-toothed tiger, email from our boss, fight with our spouse, being tired or hungry. When we get stressed, our old brain takes over and overrides our newer brain basically shutting it down until the stress is gone. So exactly when we need our new brain's willpower, it's not there. And our old brain eats cupcakes until we feel better. And our new brain can come back online. Is it any wonder that many of us feel so guilty? So for most of us, willpower failure may be more of a matter of brain wiring and evolution than a failure on our part. Anti-addiction strategy number two, substitution. This is pretty simple, but also relies on the new brain. If you have a craving for X, do Y instead. As in, substitute Y behavior for X. This has a lot of science behind it and is one of the go-to strategies that we learn in addiction psychiatry. For example, if you want to quit smoking and have a craving, eat candy instead of lighting up a cigarette. This works for many folks, But as some of the research has shown from my lab and others, it may not uproot the craving itself. As in, the habit loop stays intact, but the behavior is simply changed to something healthier. And we can argue about how healthy candy is later, but you get the idea. Since the habit loop is still there, this also makes it more likely that you fall back into the old habit at some point in the future. Anti-addiction strategy number three, prime your environment. Yes, new brain here too. Basically, this means if you're tempted by ice cream, don't keep ice cream in the freezer. This sounds pretty straightforward and I bet we can all relate to this ourselves. Several labs have specifically studied this and have found that indeed, people who have good self-control tend to structure their lives in a way that they don't need to make self-control decisions in the first place. What helps this? Routine getting in the habit of exercising every morning, or getting in the habit of buying healthy food at the grocery store makes it more routine to stay fit and to cook nutritiously. Anti-addiction strategy number four, mindfulness. This was the approach that was left out of the New York Times article I mentioned earlier. Importantly, it targets both the new brain and the old brain. So what is mindfulness? The most commonly used definition comes from my friend John Kabat-Zinn, the author of a number of best-selling books, including Full Catastrophe Living and Wherever You Go, There You Are. He also created the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program that's the most widely disseminated and studied eight-week mindfulness course on the planet. John's definition of mindfulness goes like this. The awareness that arises when paying attention in the present moment on purpose and non-judgmentally. Basically, he's pointing to two aspects of experience, awareness and having a curious attitude. Let's unpack that a bit. Remember how our old brains react to positive and negative reinforcement to determine what to do, and then is really good at turning that behavior into habits? If we aren't aware that we're doing something habitually, we will continue to do it habitually. John describes this in terms of autopilot. If we've driven the same road a thousand times, it becomes pretty habitual. We tend to zone out and think of other things while we're driving, sometimes to the point where we don't even remember how we got home from work. We were at work, then we were at home. We might remember a podcast that we listened to on the way, but that might be it. How did we get home? Magic? No. Habit. Building awareness through mindfulness helps us pop the hood in what's going on in our old brain. We can learn to recognize our habit loops while they're happening, rather than waking up at the end of them. 
Once we're aware of our habit loops, those times when we're on autopilot, we can then get curious about what's happening. Why am I doing this? What triggered that behavior? What reward am I really getting from this? Do I want to keep doing this? Here, curiosity is that key ingredient, that key attitude that helps awareness help us change habits. And it can become a powerful reward on its own. Do you remember the last time you were curious about something? That emotion's a powerful reward in itself, signaling to your old brain that this is better than a quick sugar rush followed by tons of guilt. It's almost a no-brainer. And this frees up the new brain to do what it does best, make rational and logical decisions. You tell me, what conditions make it better and easier to change a habit? When we wake up in the middle of an ice cream binge or are pulled to Amazon to look at shoes again and then judge ourselves, telling ourselves that we're a pig or whatever, is this the time when we can change these habits? Or when we become aware of the behavior and then get curious and start mapping out what our mind is doing? Oh, wow. Look at how I'm going along on autopilot like a zombie. That curiosity is key to being open and receptive to change. Carol Dweck talked about this decades ago when she described fixed versus growth mindsets. When we're stuck in our old habits, including judging ourselves, we're not open to growth. My lab has even mapped out a part of the brain that's associated with this. And Anderson Cooper from CBS's 60 Minutes came into my lab and demonstrated getting caught up in anxiety versus being mindful on camera. You know, mindfulness might be really popular or seem like it's all the rage right now, but why is this the case? In a nutshell, it's probably because of several factors, including accessibility. You can download a gazillion apps that teach you a multitude of meditation techniques, even in many languages, and also because of the science. There's been an explosion of research studies published on meditation over the past decade. But if it's so popular... Why was it left out of the article on habit change? Well, for most people, mindfulness is seen as just a way to relax and de-stress, to slow down and smell the roses. And while that's a great goal by itself, I'm most interested in what mindfulness actually does to the brain and how it can help us break bad habits. In fact, in my lab, we've scanned the brains of people while they were practicing mindfulness and mapped out the specific brain regions involved in curiosity and the ones involved in getting caught up in cravings, the root of addictive behaviors. While the scientific field around mindfulness is still young, there are some consistent findings that are coming out of the work. Studies from multiple labs have found that mindfulness specifically targets the key links of reward-based learning. And by applying specific mindfulness techniques to behavior change, my lab has found a five times better quit rate for smoking than cognitive therapy and a 40% reduction in eating in response to craving. And more recently, we found an almost 50% reduction in clinically validated anxiety symptoms in people with moderate to severe anxiety. We even did a study with anxious physicians and found a 50% reduction in anxiety. So let's summarize. Even though it might feel like we're constantly under the spell of our phones, our favorite shopping sites, social media feeds, or simply our thoughts, never before have we known so much about how our brains and minds work. The science is more solid than ever. We now know why social media is so sticky. We now know how we get caught in endless worry habits and why diets fail. And we also know how to bring together old and new brain, ironically, through techniques such as mindfulness and new science such as brain imaging. While the outlook might feel bleak when we're in the middle of an everyday addiction, the promise of specific solutions has never been better. We now have access to the same tools that marketers have been using for years, a concrete understanding of how our minds work. Don't throw away your phone or block Amazon so you can't impulsively buy yet another pair of shoes. Instead, learn how your mind works so you can work with it. Bring in awareness and curiosity to transform all of that energy in a better way. You can even lock in the habits of kindness and curiosity as those rewards that pay it forward, 
both for ourselves and others because they feel so good. Continued use with no adverse consequences. That's a winning formula. Bottom line. Number one, our brains are set up to get hooked. It's not our fault. They're just trying to help us survive. Number two, old brain acts on impulse. This is reward-based learning. Trigger, behavior, reward, repeat. This is how habits are set up so that we react on autopilot. Number three, the modern world is designed to addict. Food, phones, email, shopping, dating apps, you name it. These are all engineered to trigger dopamine release in our brains. We get addicted to everyday things. Number four, new brain. Rational, logical, decision maker. This is the seed of self-control and willpower. It's too inexperienced and weak to compete with the old brain. Number five, current habit change strategies largely rely on the new brain. And these often fail because the prefrontal cortex goes offline when we need it most. Number six, modern science. Modern science has shown that we can bring old and new together with techniques like mindfulness and other strategies such as motivational interviewing. These can tap into reward-based learning to help our brain see the lack of the reward in harmful habits, as in how bad they really feel, and the real rewards of helpful habits, as in how good it feels when we're curious and kind. And finally, number seven, understanding our minds helps us change our brains. Awareness, curiosity, and kindness are key for learning, as in these help us get into a growth mindset. If you'd like to learn more, you can click on these links and be sure to follow me on Twitter so you can learn about the latest research. Thanks for following along.